This is podcast 4.3 for chemistry. This is the last podcast in this unit. So we're going to talk about types of molecular models. How can we draw a 3D picture of these molecules? We're going to talk about exceptions to the, oct the octet rule, and then we're also going to talk about resonance structures. So we're going to touch on this quickly in the podcast, but we're going to do an in-class lab where we actually build these models of these atoms, I mean of these molecules, and you'll get to look at them while you try and draw them. So it might not make much sense to you what I'm saying as I'm doing this, but you'll get a lot more practice in class when we do these together. So what we're going to focus on today is called the structural formula. This is a way that we can draw in 3D. So we're trying to show in 3D terms what's happening with these molecules. So in class, what you're going to get are ball and stick models. You're going to actually make these so you're going to see what they look like. Then you're going to hold them up and you're going to try and draw the structural formula to represent what you're seeing with the model. And in the structural formula, there's different things. The wedges look different. Um, the lines look different. So the bonds change. When you have bonds that lay on the plane of the page, so if I had this molecule and it were sitting on this page, this hydrogen, carbon, this carbon, and this hydrogen would all be laying flat on the paper. The hydrogen that's back here with this dashed wedge and this hydrogen as well are both going behind the paper. They're going away from you as you're looking at it. And then these solid filled wedges right here are the hydrogens that are coming out at you. And you can get a sense of that a little bit by looking at this um, diagram right here. They're saying that this, that hydrogen right there, carbon, this carbon, and this hydrogen would all be laying on the paper. You can see that this hydrogen is going away from you as well as this hydrogen. And that's why they did the dashed lines there. This hydrogen is coming at you as well as this hydrogen is coming at you. So that's why they did those solid wedges like that. And we're gonna try and draw these structures um, and do a 3D representation of them. So looking at that, what I just said then for the rules, a solid line means the bond is on the plane of the paper. If you do a solid wedge, that tells you that it's coming out at you. And then the dashed line or a dashed wedge, you can use either one, means the bond is moving away from you. The atom is going away behind the plane of the paper. Okay, so practicing drawing these. Carbon tetrahydride, the only thing it could be is this. And we know that this is a tetrahedral shape. And all tetrahedrals look the same. So what you would do to draw this, and if we could actually see the model in class, you're going to have your carbon there. There is going to be one hydrogen going straight up, and there's also going to be one hydrogen that's on the plane of the paper that's coming down sideways like this. You're going to see one um, of the hydrogens going back away from you and the other hydrogen is going to be sticking out at you. So it's kind of like you have this one pointing up, this one on the paper, one going away, and then one coming at you. So that is what your structure would look like if you were to draw it using the structural formulas that we just talked about. If we did another, sulfur dioxide, Sulfur dioxide looks like um, S, and it's got a double bond to an O, a single bond to an O, and it's got a lone pair of electrons on it. If you were to build this model, it's going to be able to lay completely flat on the paper. The oxygen, the sulfur, and this oxygen would all be touching the paper. There's nothing that's going to be coming out at you. They are all on the same plane. So that means that this is also the same as what I would draw for the structural formula. They're the same. The Lewis structure and the structural formula are the same thing. Sometimes in structural formulas, you don't see the lone electrons on terminal atoms because they're not affecting the shape 
of the molecule. So on this one, for example, I don't have to put the lone electron pairs on the oxygens. I really just need the lone electron pair on the central atom. And if that's something you think you might forget, it's an okay idea just to put your lone electron pairs back on everything, even in your structural formulas. So this one, we don't have to do dashes or wedges. And any time you have a double bond, that double bond will be on the plane of the paper. So you'll never have to try to do a dash or a wedge double bond. You will always have your double bond on the plane of the paper. It's only the single bonds that come towards you or go back behind the paper. Okay, so that's it with structural formulas. Again, we're going to touch on them again in class when we build those models of the atoms. Resonance structures are when one or when there's more than one valid Lewis structure. And what we do is we put a double-sided arrow or dotted lines, but we're not going to do that. We're just going to use the double-sided arrow for possible double bond locations. And what I mean by that, let's do our example with sulfur trioxide. So sulfur has six valence electrons and so does oxygen. So this is going to have 24 electrons in the picture. So what I'm going to end up with is a sulfur in the middle. I'm going to have an O an O, and I'm going to end up with one double bonded. So I'll put in all my lone pairs. I'm going to put in all my lone pairs on the first one, but I'm not going to put it on the rest in an effort of saving time for you guys. So here's your first structure, and it does not matter. You could have put your double bond here, or here, or here, and that's what these resonance structures are. You're showing all possible locations of double bonds. So what I do is I do a double-sided arrow and I draw the structure again. But this time I'm going to move the double bond to another location. So instead of being on the bottom, I'm going to put it to this O. So there's my next one. And then my last option is to have the double bond over here. So I would draw it one more time with the double bond over there. And those would be my three resonance structures. It's showing the double bond in all three possible locations. With sulfur dioxide, you have your O double bonded to your S, single bonded to an O, and you have a lone pair on your sulfur. So if that's your original Lewis structure, you're only going to have one other resonance structure just showing the double bond on the other side. And you only need to do these resonance structures when it tells you to do so in directions. So this isn't an all the time thing, it's only if it says and include resonance structures for all molecules that need them. So there's those two examples. The last example is using the nitrite anion. And if we did this, nitrogen has five valence electrons, oxygens have six, and there's two of them, plus I have to add one more. So this is 12 plus another six would be 18. So drawing this, I'm going to have my nitrogen double bonded to my O, single bonded to my other O. So that's 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. That's my structure. Because it's an ion, I'm going to do my square brackets with the charge on the outside. And then I would only have one other resonance structure, square brackets again, O, I'm going to double bond to the left this time, and I need to make sure to keep that lone pair on my nitrogen because they're important. The rest, not so much, and again I'm going to include my charge. So resonance structures are just showing all the possible ways that you could put your double bonds in. Okay, last thing, exceptions to the octet rule. We've talked about hydrogen. Hydrogen only wants two electrons. There are others. Um, boron is happy with only six electrons. It doesn't have to have eight. It's happy if it only forms three bonds. And if you look, boron has three valence electrons. So you can see how it might be happy if it just were to accept maybe three hydrogens onto it because then all of those electrons would be paired up and it actually is stable that way. So boron can have eight, but it is okay if it only has six. That'll work. Phosphorus can have up to ten. So instead of having eight electrons around it, it can actually go up to ten. 
sulfur and xenon can go up to 12 electrons around them. So that means instead of the usual four bonds, they actually can form um, with six other atoms. And you can tell by what happens with your numbers when you're trying to kind of get your structure to match your total number of electrons, you'll be able to tell if it's an exception to the rule. So if we look at these, boron we said had three valence electrons. There's three hydrogens and they each have one. Your total is six electrons. Right away, that should tell you that this is going to be an exception to the rule because you don't you have to have at least eight if they're going to obey the octet rule. So boron here would go in the middle. I'm going to put my three hydrogens around it, and I am not going to put a lone pair because this has two, four, six electrons. This is all boron needs. That is it. That is the structure, and that's what it looks like. So if you were to look this up for its geometry, you would look up where there are three electron domains that are all bonded, no lone pairs, and you're going to see that it's trigonal planar. So those are going to separate each other by 120 degrees. All right, sulfur hexafluoride. Sulfur has six valence electrons. Fluorines, there are six of them, and they each have seven. So this is 42 so that means your total here is 48 electrons. So you're going to start by having sulfur in the middle, and it's going to cue you in that this is an exception to the rule because I have to put six fluorines around it. So one, two, three, four, five, and six. And then I have to go back. I am not going to give any more to sulfur. I am, though, going to fill in the fluorines so that they have a full octet. So I keep going around here. And then if I want to add up what I have, all I'm going to do is I'm going to know that each of these little arms that are sticking off has 8 electrons. And 8 times 6 is 48. So this is actually the correct structure for sulfur hexafluoride. Okay, this is the last set of practice problems with this. Phosphorus has five valence electrons. Chlorines, there are five of them, and they each have seven. So that's 35 plus 5 is 40. Already I know this is going to be an exception to the rule because I'm going to have to put five chlorines around the phosphorus, which is more than it would normally have. So I have my phosphorus with one chlorine, two, three, four, and five, and it doesn't matter how you arrange those around there as long as you get five in. I'm not going to put any more around the phosphorus yet. I'm going to just finish up the chlorines though and make sure they have eight because I need to make sure this is right. So again, each of these arms that I'm feeling in has eight electrons and there are five of them. So eight times five is 40. That matches the 40 there. This is the correct structure for phosphorus pentachloride. And the last one is xenon tetrafluoride. Xenon has eight valence electrons. It is a noble gas that sometimes bonds. Fluorine, there are four of them and they each have seven. Four times seven is 28 plus another eight is 36. So I'm going to start with xenon in the middle. And I'm going to put my four fluorines around my xenon. And this is looking pretty normal. Nothing weird yet. We're going to fill in fluorine. Keep on going. I'm leaving xenon alone because it at least has eight. So that makes me think it's stable. But what I find out here is that if I add this up, this is four times eight is 32 it's not enough. So I've got to add more electrons to my structure and when I have to add more I add to the central atom. So I'm going to put lone pairs on my xenon. So from 32 that would take me to 34 and that will take me to 36. So this structure has the six domains around it. Four of them are bonding. Two of them are lone pairs, so this is going to be your square planar geometry.
but you can see that if you come up short, you need to add the lone pairs to your central atom. And those are kind of good examples of exceptions that you'll run into. But that's the end of this podcast. We're going to do a lot of practice with building these models in class of these molecules and practicing to draw them in kind of a 3D format so you can really get an idea of what they look like.